Hey everybody, welcome to our first indoor worship service for the summer. We're glad you made it. Hope you're having a great 4th of July weekend. And um, I wish I could be there with you. I just thought it would be best if I didn't. Recently, I came in contact with my son who seems to be coming down with some of the symptoms for COVID and it just wasn't worth the risk of being there. So here I am, I'm live via video. Well, not live, pre-recorded. But uh, I'm glad that we could be together and I'm excited about worship this morning. So we're gonna jump into uh, a new series. We're calling it Discovering Joy. And we're all about discovering joy. So uh, let's talk about sometimes when bad days come. Have you ever had a bad day? I mean, just one of those days that just was not good. Well, here's some bad day warnings that that you can keep in mind. For instance, it might be a bad day if you wake up and you turn on the TV and you find on TV all the escape routes from your city, that might be a bad day. It might be a bad day if you call your voicemail and your voicemail tells you it's none of your business. Yeah, that might be a bad day. It might be a bad day if the bird singing outside your window is a vulture. Could be a bad day. And it, it might be a bad day, for instance, if you're looking in the mirror and you look at your picture on your driver's license and they look the same. Yeah, that could be a bad day. Those are just some warnings and hopefully you aren't having a bad day. Hopefully you're having a great weekend. And we're gonna talk about discovering joy while we're maybe having a bad day. Wouldn't it be great if even if we're having a bad day, there could be this sense of joy and peace in our lives that sustained us and filled us all the time that we're going through the difficult times. And there's this one character in the Bible who seemed to have this uncanny ability to live in joy, even though life was not going so well. And we're gonna discover his secret. So ultimately this series is gonna be about the book of Philippians. The apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians to the church at Philippi. And that, that whole book is just filled with joy. It, you read it, the tone is upbeat, but his situation isn't isn't so good. And so we're gonna look at that book and discover the Apostle Paul's secrets to living in joy. But today we're not going to Philippians. Instead, we're gonna to go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, we're gonna start at verse 16 and read through verse 40. So if you'd find that in your Bibles, we'll be uh, looking into that story in just a minute. So the Apostle Paul was a missionary to Philippi. He, he walks in to the area of Philippi and it says that one of the first things that they did in Acts chapter 16 was they, they went and tried to find a group of Jews. And so they went down by the river and they found this group of Jews who were praying and praising God and they joined in with them. And the apostle Paul says that he always approaches the Jews first in every town that he goes to and then if they reject him, then he goes to the Gentiles. Well, he goes to the Jews and he preaches to them and some reject him and some accept him. One of the people that accepts this whole concept that he's preaching about, her name is Lydia. In fact, she not only gets baptized, she takes him into her house. And so that's where he's staying and then he shifts over to reaching out to the Gentiles and he starts preaching to them. And we're gonna pick up the story kind of already in progress in Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 16. It says, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune tellings. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are the servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and he said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, 
the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and they dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. So the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Wow. You know, I'm thinking that if if I'm walking down the street and someone grabs me, drags me off the street, hauls me in and starts making accusations about me in court, that might be a bad day. And if a whole mob joins in with this person in all these attacks and accusations, that might be a bad day. And if they, they strip me and beat me with wooden rods, I think that could be a bad day. And if they throw me in jail and put me in the, in the highest security area and, and lock my feet in, in wooden blocks of wood, I would say that is a bad day. And so I think it's fairly safe to conclude that Paul and Silas have had a bad day. Have you ever had a bad day? Like, I remember my car broke down when I was miles from home. And yeah, I had a bad day. And there was a time when a guy was making false accusations about me. And that was more than just a bad day. That was a, that was a whole several months of bad days where I was completely stressed out and I so frustrated. And I, I can tell you exactly how I reacted to those bad days and it wasn't good. I was stressed. I was frustrated. I was testy to say the least. How about you? When you have a bad day, what is your reaction? How do you live? How do you, how do you do things? Are you able to take it with a, a certain grain of salt and keep your chin up? Or does something go off inside of you where you just really have a bad reaction? Well, Let's see how Paul and Silas react to all of this. We'll pick it up right where we left off. We are at verse 25. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Praying and singing hymns. I can honestly say that when I've had bad days, my first reaction was not to just pray and sing hymns. And I'm thinking that if I'm sitting in jail, in, in the highest security area of the jail, praying and singing hymns at midnight might not be a good thing if you want to make friends with the, with the fellow neighbors that you have in the cells. I mean, this is not typical. This, this isn't how most people react to a bad day. And yet Paul and Silas have this sense of joy in their life. They're tapping into something that most of us don't do. So let's just stop here for a minute and let's, let's talk about what joy is. Well, let's talk about what joy isn't. Joy isn't just suppressing bad feelings. I, I don't want you to get a picture where Christianity and joy is about like turn that frown upside down and just have a good attitude despite it being a bad situation. When I look at what Paul writes about in the book of Philippians, he's not talking about just trying to tough it out. He, he has an inner strength inside of him that's able to face those situations and, and still exude a certain excitement. Uh, an enthusiasm for life. And I, I, I also want to say that joy isn't happiness. Now, sometimes we use the terms interchangeably. In fact, oftentimes we use joy as like extreme happiness. 
And so there's some similarities between joy and happiness. They're positive feelings. It's, it's when we're feeling good, like things have aligned well in life. And so there's some of that overlap, but the Bible does use joy in a unique way. It, it talks about joy even when times are difficult. For instance, in the book of James, James chapter one, verse two, James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when trials of every kind come. And so there's this sense of being able to exude an excitement and an enthusiasm for life and where things are going, despite things not going well. See, that's, that's a trait that I really need. And so as, as we're studying this joy concept, I'm actually studying it for me. I want to really understand how joy works and how I can have that sense of enthusiasm and, and excitement for life, even when times are tough. And so I would say that Paul and Silas being beaten and accused and locked in jail, I don't know that they're necessarily happy, but they certainly do give us a picture of joy, don't they? And when the Apostle Paul writes the Philippian church, he's going to expound on that. He's gonna explain that. He's gonna throw in little tips and tricks almost. And so as we study the book of Philippians, we're gonna pick up on that. And I encourage you to even be reading Philippians ahead of time. Get to know it really well so that as we study it over the coming weeks, you'll be able to put all the pieces together and see the, the subtleties of what Paul is doing. Now, Paul and Silas, as, as I read this story, in some ways they seem kind of crazy, like, like they've gone insane. Like they don't they don't even perceive reality for what it is. And sometimes I want a little bit of that kind of crazy in my life because here's what happens when you live that way. Again, we're gonna pick it up right where we left off at verse 26. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake, like the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors were open, he, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer called for the lights and he rushed in and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them out into his house and set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can go, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial even though we're Roman citizens. And they threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. Like, this, this is just an amazing set of, this, is, this whole story is just astounding. Because Paul and Silas have this exuberant joy that they're displaying, and, and God, obviously comes in, he, he shakes the jail and everything opens up. But this jailer is so impressed with Paul and Silas, he, he puts it together. He goes like, this earthquake has to do with Paul and Silas. It's those two guys. They're the ones who are different. And so he's like, 
show me how to be saved. How, show me how to live this way. And that's exactly what they do. And I think, what a, what a witness we would be if we could find this secret of joy for our lives. I, I wonder how people around us would react if, if we could have that same, that same enthusiasm, that same excitement that Paul and Silas were showing on that night. And so it must have been a long night because the jailer cleans these guys up, takes them home, has him witness to their, his whole family. It's like he kept them up all night talking and learning about Jesus. And, and then they, they're baptized yet before morning. And then, and then he brings them back to jail only to have the magistrate to say, okay, yeah, let them go. Right? You know, they, we, we've done enough. And, and this, is, this is maybe the thing that astounds me the most is that all the way along this whole story, Paul and Silas could have stopped the whole thing if they had just brought up one fact. We're Roman citizens. You can't do this to us. And for some reason, they chose not to. They, they let them do this to them. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly why, but I do know that in the end, Paul and Silas used their Roman citizenship as leverage against the magistrates, and in fact, against the whole town. Because when they tell them, look, we're Roman citizens, what you did was absolutely illegal because you didn't, you didn't check who we were and, and what we were about. See, the, the, Christian, the Christian witness had been destroyed through all of these attacks. Um, the, the message that Paul and Silas had brought these people was, was dead because now they were just common criminals. And so if Paul and Silas would have left as common criminals, the witness that they left behind would have been dead as well. But at the last minute, they, they pull out of their secret bag this magic trick of, wait a minute, you've mistreated Roman citizens. And so the magistrates, the, the leaders of the town, have to give them like a parade kind of sending off from town as though these two guys are top dignitaries. And so the validity of their message is nailed down in Philippi because they waited to the last minute to use their Roman citizenship. In other words, Paul and Silas basically volunteered to go through all of this suffering for Jesus. And they did it with joy. I don't know about you, but that's, that's what I want for my life. I want to have this attitude of joy. I want to, to love Jesus and, and to have his joy flowing through my life. And so I invite you to join me for the next few weeks as we study the book of Philippians and, and see the secrets of how to tap into this joy. In the meantime, I have, I have a bit of an assignment for you. As you go home and you're driving with your family or after you watch the video, sit and talk a little bit about how, how good you are at tapping into joy in life. Do you have a high joy factor or is that a struggle for you? When, when do you lose your joy? And start thinking about how joy works in your life. And let's compare notes over the next few weeks as to how to build joy in our lives. All right, let's close it in prayer. Father, we want what Paul and Silas have. We want joy. We want this sense of awe and wonder and peace and connection with you that fills our lives in ways that 
that give us an enthusiasm for life and, and a sense of, of joy even, even when times are tough. And so as we study your word, we're asking you to guide us into your truth and into your peace and into, into the joy that only your spirit can give. And so go with us this week. Remind us of joy and call us into, into that life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for coming this week. And I'm going to have John close out the service. And uh, I hope that you have a great time. And I'm missing you and can't wait to see you soon. All right. We'll see you again next week.